to chessopenings.com. In today's video, we'll work our way towards understanding the strongest reply to the queen's pawn opening, which begins with the move pawn to d4. And with this move, white makes an attempt to stake the claim to as much central territory as possible by first bringing the pawn to d4, and then quite often he intends to continue with the moves pawn to c4, knight to c3, and then also with the move pawn to e4. And this is white's main goal in the queen's pawn opening. But as we'll see today, black has developed specific recipes that tend to frustrate white's attempts to gain this overwhelming center and which also threaten white's ability to gain an advantage. We'll take a look at this strongest reply today. Let's take a look. After the move pawn to d4, black's most common replies are the moves knight to f6 or pawn to d5. And both of these moves prevent the move pawn to e4. Now it's very interesting to note that even if black does not play in such a fashion as to prevent the move e2 to e4, white often does not go for e2 to e4. For example, after the moves pawn to e6 or pawn to g6, which are both sometimes played, instead of playing pawn to e4, white most often plays the move pawn to c4 with the idea of playing knight to c3 and only then going for the move pawn to e4. And also, after white plays the moves knight to f6 or pawn to d5, in both cases, white is going to play the move pawn to c4, usually with the idea of bringing the knight out to c3. Therefore, it is most accurate to say that when white opens up with the queen's pawn opening, his major idea is to continue with the moves pawn to c4 and knight to c3. This is an important part of the plan when we open up with the queen's pawn opening. Now, interestingly, white's idea of placing pawns on d4 and c4 is quintessential to the queen's pawn opening. Yet there are relatively few games in which we see the counter idea with the moves e2 to e4 and pawn to f4 in the opening, and we're going to explain why. When white opens up with the moves pawn to d4 and pawn to c4 to control the center, he opens up his queen's diagonal, the diagonal d1 to a4, and the queen can sometimes profit from this activity. When white opens up with pawns on e4 and f4, he opens up his king's diagonal. And in this case, since the king can only move one square at a time, and because the king must be protected against checkmate, this often serves as a demerit for white rather than a benefit. Even if white castles his king on the king's side, he will still often find that moving the f-pawn too soon is a little bit of a problem because white can suffer from untimely checks along the g1 to a7 diagonal. This explains why when white opens up with the king's pawn opening, when white opens up with the move pawn to e4, he often does not base his chances for the advantage on bringing out the f-pawn, but instead looks for the rapid or the gradual advance of the d-pawn to d4 as a way to support his control of the center. For example, in the very popular Sicilian opening, a main line would be pawn to c5, knight to f3, pawn to d6, pawn to d4, the crucial pawn break, pawn takes pawn on d4, and knight takes pawn on d4, and here in this position, white's advantage in the center is based on the centralized position of his knight on d4, and the ease of developing his minor pieces, and even his queen in certain cases. Another example from the king's pawn opening, which features the ability to play d2 to d4 as being crucial, would be the Ruy Lopez, after the moves, pawn to e5, knight to f3, attacking the e5 pawn, knight to c6, defending, bishop to b5, the Ruy Lopez, pawn to a6, bishop to a4, knight to f6, following the main line here, white castles kingside, bishop to e7 is played, rook to e1, and now that the pawn on e4 is protected, white threatens to play bishop takes c6, so there follows, pawn to b5, Bishop to b3, pawn to d6, 
c3, preparing the crucial d4 advance. Castles kingside, pawn to h3, knight to a5, bishop to c2, c5, still following a main line here. And now the crucial advance, pawn to d4. And in this position, white has an advantage of space in the center based on his ability to bring the d-pawn to the d4 square. Thus, while the moves d4 and the moves e4 are both characterized by attempts to gain an advantage in central territory, the means which are used in either opening vary greatly. The idea of placing a duo of pawns on d4 and c4 is quintessential to the queen's pawn opening, whereas we do not see the same idea repeated in the king's pawn opening with pawns on e4 and f4. And this difference stems from the starting position of the queen and the king in the game of chess. Now, after white opens up with the move pawn to d4, black's most popular reply at the top level is to continue with the move knight to f6. White continues with pawn to c4, and now the most popular move, and the move which I believe is the strongest reply for black, is to continue with the simple move pawn to e6. And one of the key attractive features about moving with the pawn e6 is that in addition to possibly preparing to play the move d7 to d5, black is also preparing to develop his dark squared bishop swiftly. And in the event of the move knight to c3, which we've said is a key part of white's plan in the queen's pawn opening, in the event of knight to c3, Black now has the ability to play a crucial pin with the move bishop to b4. And this is called the Nimzo Indian variation or opening. With the move bishop to b4, Black indirectly controls the e4 square, since now, if White were to play the move pawn to e4, Black can reply, will reply, with the move knight takes e4, as there is now a pin against the knight on c3. Therefore, the move bishop to b4 actually prevents white from being able to expand into the center with the move pawn to e4. Because of this fact, white must temporarily relax his ambitions to gain this overwhelming central pawn majority, and he must instead content himself with some different ideas, usually he's gonna go for the bishop pair in this position by forcing black to capture on c3. For example, white can and often does re reply with the move queen to c2 here. And now after the main line continuation, castling kingside, pawn to a3, bishop takes c3 check, and queen takes c3, white has managed to gain the bishop pair and he also still has an advantage of space in the center. The bishop pair may come in handy later, and white may benefit from the central territory, especially if he is able to eventually bring a pawn to e4. But black has had quite decent results in this position, and it even appears that he has great chances of equalizing here. Black can, and often does, deploy his pawns either to the d5 square or the c5 square, or both, and often white will find that he needs to move the queen a third time in the event of the c-file opening up. Black's flexibility about how to handle his pawns, the d-pawn, the c-pawn, or even to ignore this altogether and simply play b6 followed by bishop to b7, Black's ability to choose from any number of plans is one of the key aspects of the Nimzo Indian that gives Black greater flexibility in this opening. The other main approach for white in this position is to simply continue with the move pawn to e3, paving the way for the bishop to simply develop with bishop to d3, and also postponing the move a2 to a3 until black has already deployed his d-pawn to the d5 square. For example, if black were to now play the move pawn to d5, now white can go for the move a2 to a3, since after the exchange, bishop takes c3 check and b takes c3, white will have no problem whatsoever in undoubling his pawns with the move c takes d5 at the time of his choosing. To show a more mainline example of how this works, rather than pawn to d5, black most often continues with the move 
castling kingside. This is the main line. Bishop to d3 is played. Pawn to d5 is played. White usually simply continues with development right now with knight to f3. Pawn to c5. Castles kingside. And now, after knight to c6, this is the moment when white normally goes for the move. Pawn to a3. Bishop takes c3. And b takes c3, gaining the bishop pair. And also, white will have no trouble whatsoever in undoubling his c pawns since he can now play c takes d5 at any time. While white has gained the bishop pair in this position, white's position is still a little bit cramped since the pawn on e3 obstructs the bishop on c1 and it's somewhat difficult to find a meaningful square for this piece. Another very interesting option which black has available in the Nimzo Indian, in this position for black, is rather than playing the move knight to c6 in this position, black can also play pawn takes pawn on d4, pawn takes pawn on d4, pawn takes pawn on c4, and bishop takes c4, and this is known for black as the Karpov variation. Now, white is basing his chances of the advantage here on the ability to rapidly bring his pieces to very aggressive squares. For example, white is often going for bishop g5, rook c1, rook e1, and often some sort of queen sortie such as queen e2 and beyond in this position. And this can be very dangerous for black if he's not careful in this position. However, at the same time, black's ability to bring his pawn up to the c5 square and to initiate pawn exchanges in the center has left white with a weakened pawn on d4. And just as importantly, black has very little problem finding active squares for his pieces in this position. For example, after the standard moves b6 and bishop to b7, which will usually be played at some point in this position, black's bishop profits from this wide open diagonal where it is no longer obstructed by a pawn on d5. My own games handling this position with white and also sifting through the statistics and games played in this position have demonstrated to me that black is very close to complete equality in these variations. These variations demonstrate that the Nimzo Indian is a powerful reply to the Queen's Pawn opening. With the Nimzo Indian, black is actually taking the best advantage of white's key plan in the Queen's Pawn opening which was to bring the pawn to d4, the pawn to c4, and the knight to c3. First of all, black is able to profit from the pin and even creates a dangerous threat of capturing on c3 and compromising white's pawn structure somewhat. Also, since black has used a minimum of pawn moves to develop his pieces, black is often castling swiftly and then looking for ways to bring out his central pawns while white often has to scurry to complete his development a little bit more. This flexibility of plans and the possibility of damaging the pawn structure are part of what makes the Nimzo Indian such a strong and powerful reply to the Queen's Pawn opening. Also, this analysis today helps us to understand why now players are beginning to prefer or have been preferring for some time to play the move knight to f3. This is now becoming the slightly preferred move as this temporarily avoids the pin of bishop to b4 and forces black to demonstrate how he plans to address the situation in the center or to commit to a plan of development before white goes for this move knight to c3. Also, today's analysis shows why the move pawn to g6 as opposed to pawn to e6 is a somewhat more pleasant option for white to face. Here, white has no difficulty at all in continuing with the main plan of knight to c3 and then of achieving the move pawn to e4, and so white often has a better chance of achieving an overwhelming central space advantage and gaining an advantage in these lines. That's all for today, and I hope to see you soon.